Hi, welcome to our Sunday sermon. It is the 28th of July. We're going to be in Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. And uh, let's just continue to pray for Mickey and his recovery, for Jim Tassone and his recovery from his knee surgery. Um, be with uh, uh, Michael Hunt. Michael's having open heart surgery coming this Wednesday. So just be praying for him as he uh, is nervous about it and just pray that God have his hand upon that surgery. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We ask you to continue to guide and direct our Study today, be with Mickey, uh, be with uh, Marisha, uh, be with Jim, be with uh, Karen's mom also, Karen and Dave as uh, the camp in Mexico goes this week. So we pray for Becky and Hans as they do that. We pray for Michael Hunt and his open heart surgery on Wednesday and just pray for that and pray for uh, uh, Susie as she heads back to North Carolina and uh, takes care of some fire damage to her fields. And we just pray, Lord, for not too much damage there. A lot of things, a lot of needs. We lift them up to you. Pray for our country. Pray for this election. Pray for your hand to be upon this world, Lord. Uh, let souls be saved, Father. Let people be redeemed and loved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, and that is the theme today. Um, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, uh, you have been redeemed and, and you are uh loved everlastingly uh, by Jesus. Uh, this chapter starts with um, an interesting phrase that kind of gives us a little bit of timeline. It says, at the same time. Uh, so chapter 31 of Jeremiah. In the same time, it would be the ending of chapter 30, which starts with the latter days, you will consider it. So we talked last week about the blessings of the latter days. We actually read through uh, Revelation uh, 21 and 22, uh, talked about heaven, talked about how great it's going to be and how we're sealed to the day of redemption. Um, and no one will pluck us out of the Father's hand. And, and so this chapter deals with that same time period. Uh, and so we're going to walk through it um, uh, and, and not spend a lot of time in the chapter, but outside the chapter. Uh, but it is a chapter of love and redemption. And so it says, at the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. This is for some reason uh, controversial when you start talking about the restoration of Israel, the redemption of Israel, the restored relationship between God and Israel. For some reason, people bring politics into it and people get pretty angry about it uh but this this idea of redemption whether it's talking about israel returning from babylon or talking about returning to a nation in 1948 or talking about returning to the worship of god at, at the end times in the latter days uh, the idea of redemption and returning uh, is significant to all of us because uh, how it affects us and as that applicable to us is that as the human race uh, was walking with God and talking with God until Adam ate the fruit and then sin and death was passed to all men. We are now separated from God. We are slaves to sin and <laughs> bondage to sin. It's very uh, similar to Hosea in Gomer in the book of Hosea where he married this harlot and, and she left him. She went and and pay the money necessary to own her and buy her back. And so that's redemption. Ransom was paid uh, because of his love for her, no matter what she did. And that's the love that God has for us. And so we don't want to lose this, this effect of love for Israel. Israel, over and over again throughout the Old Testament, has kicked against God, walked against God, rebelled against God, like sheep went astray. And God's love for them never wavers. Uh, he sends them to Babylon only to bring them back. And he says, I will be the God of all the families of Israel. And this, this idea of I will, that phrase I will happens about 15 times in this chapter. So this is a chapter about what God will do in these latter days. 
so instead of focusing on the, the Israelite part, let's focus on what he'll do for you. As we are told in the New Testament that we are grafted into all of the promises. Um, so he says in verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest. And so this is all by grace. The word grace means to be given a gift that we don't deserve. For by grace we've been saved through faith. The gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. Um, so we have this beautiful grace of God, or by grace have you been saved. Uh, we're saved by grace through faith. And so grace is this gift of salvation given to us when we don't deserve it. It's incredible. The Lord appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Man, what a verse. That God has loved Israel with an everlasting love. Uh, God says that he loved us, the world, so much that he gave his only begotten son in John 3, 16, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's no one that's going to pluck you out of God's hand. There's no one that's going to separate you from the love of God. The love God has for you is an everlasting love. We're the ones that kick against the goads, kick against the... The, the scriptures and, and want to do our own thing and want to rebel and want to go astray. But God loves Israel, loves them everlastingly. And God loves you as a child of God everlastingly. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 9, this, in this, the love of God was manifested or revealed toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the full payment for our sins. 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because he first loved us. Uh, this, this love of God is not that, man, we are such good people that God loves us. There's not much lovable about us, and our flesh dwells no good thing. All we like sheep have gone astray. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. And God still, in his grace, has loved us. Romans 5 eight says, God demonstrates his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's no greater love than this, and a man laid down his life for a friend. And Romans 5.7, it might be okay to die for a good man. But God died for us while we were still sinners. So it just uh, makes logical sense that if God loved us while we were sinners, he certainly loves us while we're trying our best to please him and, and do things for him. He says in verse 3, Therefore, with his loving kindness, I have drawn you. The Bible says, Jesus says, No one comes to me unless the Father draws him. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, and God opened up our eyes quickened through his word those who were dead, made us alive. It's a beautiful thing. Mark 4, 26 and 27 says, The kingdom of God is like a man who sows seed and goes to sleep at night, and he wakes up, he has crops, and he doesn't know how they grew. That is the kingdom, that we throw out the seeds of the gospel, and for some reason it takes root in some, and the four different grounds, it doesn't always take root. And why does it take root in me? Why am I saved of all people? I'm the least. Uh, you know, Paul called himself the chiefest of all sinners, but I, I, I find that that's only because I wasn't born yet. And I feel like that, that, that God's love for me is, is full of grace and full of mercy, and yet it's everlasting. We are loved by God. It's incredible. And we are redeemed by God. Look at these next verses. He says again, verse 4, I'll build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with your tambourine. You shall go forth in dances of those who rejoice. Remember, this is written at the time they're in captivity in Babylon. 
But he says, you're going to yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria. Uh, the planters shall plant and eat them as ordinary food. Now, remember, Samaria was the northern kingdom. So God's bringing all the tribes back. For there shall be a day when the watchmen will cry on Mount Ephraim and say, Arise and let us go to Zion, to the Lord our God. Usually on the mountain, they're, they're looking for the enemy to come. But instead of saying, watch out, watch out, there's enemy coming, they're going to say, look, it's the Lord. Let's go to him. For thus saith the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob and shout among the chief nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. O Lord, save my soul. Salvation. He says, verse 8, Behold, I'll bring them from the north country, gather them from the ends of the earth, among the blind, the lame, the woman with child, the one who labors with child together. Great throng shall return there. They shall come up with weeping, with supplications. I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in the straight way in which they will not stumble. For I am the father of Israel and Ephraim, my firstborn. Ephraim being the son of Joseph, second son. But it, it's also uh, connected to the 10 tribes in the nation of Israel. Uh, so God says, I will bring them. Remember the Bible says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, leads me besides the still waters. Wednesday night, we had a great uh, look at the uh, chapter of Psalm 23, the 23rd Psalm. I encourage you to, to read it. It really goes together well with this uh, scripture as God is leading us to that, that everlasting grace and love and mercy of God, leading us to that latter days in victory. He says in verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Declare it on the isles afar off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him. Keep him as a shepherd does his flock. The Lord is my shepherd. We will gather together to meet him in the air. We talked about that last week all these chapters and verses coming together because that's what the Bible is all about. The Bible is about uh, the, the, the human race that has been separated from God because of sin. We have been enslaved by our flesh, enslaved by sin, captured by the enemy, Satan, turning against God. And God, out of his unbelievable love, Fix the problem by sending his only begotten son, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. To do what? Well, look at verse 11. Verse 11 is the key verse in this whole chapter, in this whole lesson. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. We're enslaved by our sin, in bondage to our sin, enslaved by the enemy Satan. But 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. And God has redeemed us. Luke 1, 68 says, blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he visited and redeemed his people. That's in Luke. Blessed is the Lord God. He visited in the person of Jesus Christ and redeemed his people. In other words, he purchased us back. We were the harlot that went and played harlot with the enemy, left God and, and uh, served two masters. We walked with God and we talked with God, and yet through the sin of Adam, passed on from generation to generation. We are now enslaved, just like Gomer. And yet God reached down with his son, paid the ransom due, the propitiation, in order to purchase us back, redeem us, and make us look at you have this 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 can of soda and uh, uh, with Pepsi in it. What a valuable can that is because it carries the, the unbelievable, beautiful taste of Pepsi. Um, but once that Pepsi is gone, the can is shriveled up and, and, and tossed. Now the can can be thrown into the garbage pit or you can do what my wife does. You can take this can and put it in a bag that will be taken and redeemed to, to given a purpose to, to, to be useful again and, and recycled and reused. And that's what God does with us. We're garbage. We're filthy rags. And yet through the purchase 
of our souls by the blood of Christ, we are redeemed and, and gone from filthy rags to the family of God. Matthew 28, uh, 20, verse 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. What is the wages of sin? Death. The payment for sin is death. And that must be the death of, of a lamb, of a perfect, without spot, without blemish. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Have he become a curse for us? For it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree or a cross. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So by grace are you saved through faith. It's the story of the universe. Man walked with God and talked with God until we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Once mankind had the knowledge of evil, uh, by the time Noah got around, the thoughts were, were evil continually. And man's righteousness became like filthy rags. And God had a plan that he would send a, a, a seed between the woman and the serpent. And that seed would be Christ. And he would be the ransom, the to buy us back, put us back in fellowship with God, back in the family of God. First Peter 1.18 says, Knowing that you're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. See, Jesus was that lamb of God. We are purchased back, bought back, redeemed with blood. And that blood must be only the blood of God, because it must be perfect. Colossians 1.14, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. Uh, spiritually, that, that blood washes our sins away. That's baptism. The, going into the water, that shows what God did for you. But when you trust in Christ and his redemptive work on the cross and his shed blood as the propitiation for your sins, then you're saved. Your sins are washed away. Romans, Revelation 5, 9, they were waiting for someone to open these scrolls. These scrolls would bring about an end to sin and darkness and death like we talked about last week. And there was only one worthy. It was the Christ to open these seals. And Revelation 5, 9 says, they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. It's neither Jew nor Greek, rich nor poor. And you've made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. What God did for us when he paid the price on the cross with his precious blood, uh, that he is now the name above all names because he became obedient unto death, even death on the cross, Philippians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says this, Do you not know that your body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God, and you're not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So part of that is the oh, not just the, 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 the purchasing of you back from the enemy, back from the slave of sin, uh, but you are now owned by God, gloriously and beautifully His, with His everlasting love, bought with the price of His own shed blood on the cross. That is redemption. That is being purchased back. That is taking a life that is as unworthy ungodly, unhelpful, and making it a life of purpose and a life with a future. You are purchased back. You, if you've trusted in Jesus, have been redeemed. And once you've been redeemed, everything changes. Galatians 4, 3, even so when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Uh, that we were slaves to sin and addictions and all those things that come with it. 
But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of a son in your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir of God through Christ. It is much more than just being saved, and now I'm going to heaven, and I'm on my own. No, when God purchased you, it was an adoption process. See, we're, we're not foster children. Uh, when you have a foster child, they don't take your name. They don't become an heir. And you are uh, compensated for watching that, that foster child. When you adopt a child, that child takes your name. That child becomes an heir to whatever you would leave to your children. And you are responsible for the, the, the financial cost of that child. You're not compensated. They become yours. It's a sacrificial act of love to give a child your name. And we cry, Abba, Father, that we have been adopted by Christ, not brought back to be a slave. We yield ourselves as slave. But God says, no, you're not a slave. You're a son. You're a child. You are given the power and the right to be called the children of God. What a blessed, uh, incredible uh, grace and mercy of redemption purchased back. Titus 2.13 says, We look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. You've been cleansed from every lawless deed and purified. Therefore, the natural response of this information is your mourning, your weeping should be turned to joy. Look at verse 12. Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion. Streaming to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and new wine and oil for young of the flock and the herd. Their soul shall be like a well-watered garden and they shall sorrow no more at all. That's Revelation 21, 1 through 4. We read that last week. Then shall the virgin rejoice and dance and the younger men and the old men together. For I'll turn their mourning to joy. I will comfort them and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I'll satiate the soul of the priest with abundance. My people shall be satisfied with the goodness, says the Lord. We read this in Psalm 23, 6, says the surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. John 16, 20, most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Uh, in this world, we may have troubles. In this world, we may have trial. I struggle with joy. I do. The last couple of years has been a particularly tough time for me as far as my joy for some reason. Uh, but when I think about the latter days, uh, I can do nothing but rejoice in knowing that I'm forgiven, my sins are washed away, and I'll be absent from the body and present with the Lord Psalm 30, verse 5 says, His anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy is coming. You've been redeemed. You've been bought back. Your sins have been paid for. The grace of God has brought you salvation. If you trust in, in, in what he tells you is the gospel, that Jesus is the propitiation who came to this world, who died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day. That's the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. And whoever believes in him will never perish, but have everlasting life. He's for the morning to be turned to joy. First, your joy must be turned to mourning, because there needs to be a time of repentance, a time when you recognize the need to be redeemed. So if you think you're fine and you don't have any issues and you're perfect and you don't need 
to be purchased back. I'm just fine without God. That's a completely different issue. So the Lord says in verse 15, a voice heard from Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her, uh, for her children, because they are no more. Now this is a, a picture of, of Rachel buried in Ramah. She died after giving birth to Benjamin. And uh, she is weeping for her children. Well, the Bible tells us that in Matthew chapter 2, when Jesus was just a, a child, um, he was instructed to go to Egypt, Joseph and Mary, to take him to Egypt, because Herod was going to go and start murdering those children, men, boy, male children, two years old and younger. Um, and in talking about this situation in Matthew 2, 17, Matthew writes, this then was fulfilled, which was spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, saying a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they were no more. So that's the picture of, of this verse being used as, as a New Testament verse. But while there was weeping at that time, mourning for the children that were killed and, and taken, God had protected the Messiah by sending Jesus to Egypt. So he says in verse 16, refrain from weeping and your eyes from tears for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord. They shall come back from the land of your enemy. That's, that's both in the future, also when they come back from Babylon. There's hope for your future, says the Lord. Your children shall come back from their border. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. You have chastised me. I was chastised. This is Israel crying out for forgiveness. Like an untrained bull, restore me and I will return. For you are the Lord my God. Surely after my turning, I repented. After I have instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. I was ashamed humiliated because I bore the reproach of my youth. So there you see they're repenting. You see this joy that we talked about, your mourning turning to joy, it only comes when you realize your need to, see, if you don't need to be forgiven, there's nothing to rejoice over. But if you're like me and you hate that flesh and you hate that sin, you hate the selfishness and the pride and all those things that go along with this stinky flesh. Things I want to do, I don't do. If you, if you want to please God and you want to go to God and say, God, is there any way you could forgive me that you could ever love me? And God says, oh, I love you with an everlasting love. I love you so much. I sent my only begotten son to die for you. I love you so much that I will show mercy on you. Look at verse 20. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For though I speak against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. And he will surely have mercy on you. If you will surrender, humble yourself, and pray. The Bible says, submit to God in James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. See, when your joy, and that joy here is the reveling in your flesh. I don't need God. I live any way I want. I'm going to parade myself and show my sin to everybody. And if I, you don't like what I do, I want to uh, set fires and I'm going to do whatever I want. And we hate God and we don't want this and we don't want that. And you revel and rejoice in your sin. There is no redemption for you. But if you come to the point as an individual and say, God, forgive me. Lord, I'm tired of this life. I'm tired of this flesh. God, if you can forgive me, well, do you still love me? Can you still accept me? Can you still redeem me? Do you want me? God says, I yearn for you. I'll have mercy on you. 
So he says in verse 21, set a signpost, make a landmark, set your heart toward the highway, the way in which you went. Turn back, O virgin Israel, turn back to the cities. How long will you gad about on your backsliding daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in this earth. A woman shall compass a man. And many believe that's a picture of the Virgin Mary carrying the Messiah. Or it could be a picture of Israel, the woman Israel embracing God. Either way, it's a picture that if you'll turn back, or maybe today you don't believe that, that God could ever forgive you. Maybe you have sins in your life that, that you believe are so terrible that God could never redeem you, that you are unredeemable. None of that is true. It's a lie of the devil, the same devil who, who got us into this mess uh, through the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. But God is greater. Thus saith the Lord of hosts in verse 23, they shall again use the speech in the land of Judah and its cities when I bring back their captivity. Look at verse 25, for I've satiated the weary soul. I have replenished or redeemed or restored every sorrowful soul. Your sorrow can only be turned to joy when your joy apart from God is turned to sorrow that you don't have. If you rejoice that you don't have God and you rejoice that you're not religious and you rejoice that you don't have this Bible to follow, uh, there's no redemption for you until that joy is turned to humility and sorrow and a need for Jesus Christ. Look at none of us are perfect. None of us walk right. And you think, well, you Christians think you're better than everybody. We don't. In fact, when I tell you I'm a Christian, I'm telling you I am a vile, horrible human being in need of a Savior. And that Savior loves me with an everlasting love. He has purchased me back from my sinful state, uh, washed those sins away, and remembers them no more. Look what he says in verse 26. After this, I awoke and looked around, and my sleep was sweet to me. We talked about uh, being made to lie down in green pastures on Wednesday night, and this sweet sleep of, of Proverbs 3. And it's different for Jeremiah. He's had a pretty rough time, and now he wakes up with this news that God has gave him about the future of Israel and the future of all those who trust in his Messiah. And he's, it's a sweetness that he hasn't expressed or experienced in most of this time. And he says in verse 27, Behold, the days are coming. And these days are coming. He says in verse, end of verse 28, he says, I'll watch over them to build and plant, says the Lord. Verse 29, in those days they shall no more say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now I don't like anything sour. And we talked about sour grapes. We have a definition for it. But in this particular um, context, it's the idea that over the 70 years, many children were born in Babylon and they were born into slavery. They were born slaves. They had no choice, but they didn't do anything wrong. It's the idea of the sins of the father passed down from generation to generation. And God says when the fathers ate the sour grapes, that the children's were set on edge. But look at verse 30. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. In this new covenant, verse 31, behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant. In this new covenant that supersedes the old one, there's no more family curses passed down. You are responsible for your own actions. And in this responsibility, uh, you are going to make a decision to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will forgive you and give you rest or to keep kicking against them. It's time to quit blaming our ancestors and, and our generations and our country and our parents and our, for all of it. Maybe there's some responsibility there that brought us to a place of, of sorrow, but that sorrow can be turned to joy simply by turning to the one who created you, the one who supersedes all of those, the one greater than our enemy, the one greater than, than our politicians, the one greater than our pastors, the one greater than our denominations, the one who died for you. 
look to him. He says, I'll make you a new covenant. And this is Jesus. It talks about it. He says in verse 32, not according to the covenant I made with the fathers, that I took them out of the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Now, this new covenant, this is different. This is not a national covenant in which all of Israel suffers because, no, this is going to be you as an individual can be saved from the sins of the world through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse 33 says, This covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I'll put my law on their minds. I'll write it on their hearts. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. No more shall man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. Right now, we're not there yet because we have to ask people. I'm asking you to get to know Jesus, to get to know God. But there's going to come a time when there's going to be nobody lost around. They're thrown in the lake of fire. They're done. And those who have trusted in Christ had their sins beautifully, mercifully washed away. There won't be any need to, to go out and, and do soul winning. The souls will be one. From the least of them to the greater of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Well, what is this new covenant? Well, it's Jesus. It says that in Hebrews 10, verse 16. This is the covenant I'll make with them after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my law on their heart and their minds. I'll write on them. And he adds their sins and lawless deeds. I will remember no more. That is Jesus, the one offering that he perfected forever, Hebrews 10, 14. And so this is the new covenant. It's Jesus in which now there's no more sour grapes. It's you and God alone. Do you trust in him? You're not going to heaven because you're in a Christian home, and you're not going to hell because you're in an awful home. You are going to heaven or hell completely dependent upon whether you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and turn to him for salvation. Maybe you don't need him. Maybe you don't need to be redeemed. But I think you know you do. I think you know we're not perfect. I think you know the thoughts that are in your head. I think you know how evil all these thoughts and feelings can be. And you know that you need to be purchased back. Thus saith the Lord, who gives sun for light and day. So this is God's promise. It, 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 and when he says it, his yeas are yeas and his nays are nays. And he says in verse 38, behold, these days are coming. And he talks about all of the land given back to Israel in these last verses. And he says in the last sentence of chapter 31, it shall not be plucked up or thrown down anymore forever. There's going to come a time when this new covenant that supersedes the old, but it's only possible through the grace and the mercy of Jesus, who sent his only son to redeem us through the shed blood. Well, this everlasting love, the Bible says, last verse, I am persuaded, Romans 8, 38, that neither death or life, nor angels or principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He loves you as his child with an everlasting love. If you have repented and been converted, been redeemed, that's the message today. It's the message of ransom redemption. We have been kidnapped by the world, taken over by sin, and God has paid the ransom to purchase you back make you his adopted sons and daughters to be called the children of God and to love you with an everlasting love and to have in the future all these things he's talked about. What a God. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. Let us grasp, embrace, and live in the reality of how much you love us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. And uh, continue to uh, pray for those prayer requests we brought earlier. Thank you.